Hey guys, my name is Forrest. Hey guys, I'm Rebecca and we're the trumpet players from Mid Cities Brass. In this video, we're going to show you how the trumpet works, what it does and does not do, and then what we can make it uh, do well as individuals. Uh, when you're writing your parts, keep in mind who you want to write for based on what we're going to show you throughout the duration of this entire video. So with that being said, let's get started. So in this first section, we're going to be talking about the instrument itself, the trumpet, and how it works. So we buzz into a mouthpiece into the lead pipe right here, which produces a harmonic series. Um, and we can change the pitch by altering the speed of air, the position of our tongue, and the tension of our lips, which I will demonstrate by sirens on a mouthpiece. By changing the speed of air, you're able to go higher and lower. And I'm going to demonstrate what the harmonic series sounds like with uh, the lead pipe in the horn. Alright, so in this section we're going to talk about what the instrument can generally do well and what it can't do well. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a brief history of the trumpet. And these valves are actually a recent addition in history. Um, a lot of people call, mistakenly call this a bugle, but they're actually kind of right. And it's because when you play open, this actually is a bugle. And when you put down your second valve, it's also a bugle, but a half step lower. Then you put down the next valve, it's a bugle, but a whole step lower, and etc. So there's actually seven bugles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they all play bugle calls. Um, what bugle calls, and I'm not a historian in any way, but I'm going to give you a brief history on this. Uh, what bugle calls typically have been, have been some type of, of signal for, for whatever reason. Um, if it was uh, a trumpet player being on a watchtower, looking for intruders coming in, they would sound a bugle call to alert the town that people were intruding. And they would have different bugle calls for this. So, and I actually don't know what they would play specifically, but let's say people were coming, they would have... And if I, like a, a storm was coming that they needed to like seek shelter in, it would be. But basically, they would everybody recognize these bugle calls as some type of signal, and this would also be for a call to arms, for like a military militaristic view, or whatever else the trumpet player was using at the time. So in in compositions, especially in symphonies, you'll hear a trumpet being played, and a lot of times it symbolizes troops coming, it symbolizes people, intruders coming, and sy symbolizes something. And, um, and that just kind of maintains the, like, the, the nostalgia of like, what trumpet player would have been in, in, at, at that time. Um, a lot of times you'll also see that trumpet players play backstage, um, and this gives the, the effect that a trumpet player is playing off in the distance, the same way they would if they're signaling an army or signaling that someone's intruding. So, that's kind of the history of the trumpet. And the reason why we tell you this is because we want you to know that although you're going to be writing for brass quintets, uh, you can still, you know, have us face the other way uh, or still put some of the, the historic um, ideas of the trumpet in the music and it will be very obvious if you put a bugle call in there. So that's just something to keep in mind. But uh, moving on to what the trumpet actually can do now, uh, we're going to start talking about range and dynamics. And when I'm talking about range, I'm going to be talking for the B flat trumpet and in the key of B flat. So the lowest note we can play is low F sharp. And the highest note we can play is D. And that is low F sharp to D is the usable range that you can write for. Uh, when you write on the ends of it, so closer to the bottom, like to the low F sharp, or you write closer to the top, closer to the D, you're going to be losing a little bit of clarity and flexibility and character of sound um, in a few different ways. So first of all, playing low, or um, yeah, playing low, you can't really play it that loudly, and same thing playing high. Everything's like a little bit condensed. Um, so I'm going to play low F sharp really loudly and you're gonna hear what it's gonna sound like. It's kind of raspy, but especially when a tongue or do something, it's not it's gonna sound pretty thumpy. It sounds thumpy because you're you're having it, it's closer to the end so it's gonna be harder to deal with. Now if you play the F sharp you can do the same effect 
in the staff. So you can still maintain the characteristic of the instrument if you basically compose a third above that low F sharp or a third below the D. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't play those notes. They are very situational. But if, again, if you want clarity, if you want flexibility and agility and everything, that you, I would advise you not to write on the top. Um, you can play the D above the staff, like on a, on a chord at the end of a piece or something really loudly. And it can, have, it can be very impactful. But once again, I couldn't play. Um, I'm just going to make something up real quick. Like that's very difficult versus So just know when you're writing closer to the bottom of the top you're gonna uh, get some some differences in them. Um, now if you're writing a jazz piece or something this the range goes a little bit higher. And the reason why I say for jazz pieces is because this mouthpiece that I'm using is a mouthpiece that I use for classical music. If I use a mouthpiece that I would play for like lead trumpet and jazz or something, I would use a lead mouthpiece. So it's kind of like um, if you're playing golf, you use the right tools for the situation. So if you're writing a jazz piece or if you want a very piercing quality, um, I would go ahead and put a lead piece in and then I'd play the notes accordingly. And then in this, the usable range now goes up to about a double A above the staff. Okay, so that's basically for jazz music though. So if you're writing a classical piece for us, please, please do not write that high. I, I, it will not sound good, I promise. Okay, so that's the range of dynamics. Um, going on to articulation, um, trumpet players and brass players have a very, they're, we're very fortunate that we can articulate in a lot of different ways, a variety of ways. Um, we can play things staccato, um, stacchissimo, and tenuto. We can double tongue, which brass players, uh, bassoonists, and flute players really can. Clarinets, I, I still don't know if they can or can't. Um, I hear from different from different colleagues that they can or can't, but I don't know. Nonetheless, we can double tongue. We can triple tongue, which is the same thing as double tongue, just in a triplet. Last thing we do is flutter, which fun fact, I actually can't flutter tongue. I, I do this weird mix of a ground flutter and most of players can flutter, but yeah, just, just FYI. And typically when you write a flutter tongue, it's on a sustained notes or on um, like, uh, but yeah, so on a sustained note, you would write it, and then you would maybe put a crescendo or something, and it have a lot of zip to it. And so that's a flutter tongue, and that's a cool technique you can do. So that's articulation. Um, next thing we want to move on is to slurs. Uh, we can basically slur anything that we can play or articulate. But it uh, slurring, because there's, there's, there's no stopping or... Uh, pause or space between the notes, you're gonna hear the discrepancies between the intervals more. So you can do small slurs. You can do slurs in thirds. You can do slurs in fourths. Which I know the last one was in a fourth. Um, and yeah, so you can do those cleanly. Now, when you get to about a perfect fifth and a higher for slurs, you're going to hear a lot of bumpiness. Um, it's very hard to execute uh, a good slur that's over a fifth or even an octave. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you now is I'm gonna start on low C and I'm going to slur a second and then a third and a fourth 
and I'm going to go all the way up two octaves so you can know basically the quality of what this slur is going to sound like. So it gets it gets a little rough as it gets higher and it's a lot harder to execute, especially in fast music, it's not really gonna be a thing. Um, and so this kind of goes into intervals. Uh, there are attainable intervals and there are difficult intervals. Basically, the smaller the interval, the easier it's going to be to play. Uh, the space doesn't really matter as much in slow music, but if you're, if you're putting in 16th notes, or, or like a piano would do a tremolo a lot, like, like that would not sound like <laughs> it's not gonna sound good so the the smaller the interval the better it's, um, result you're going to have with it and that's my part of this video so now we're gonna start talking about colors so uh, colors on the trumpet they go hand in hand with dynamics uh, range and articulation um, for example the Pines of Rome offstage solo uh, is mid to high range solo and it's played off stage with legato and slurred articulation markings, uh, which make it, although it's in the high range, still make it sound soft and sweet. Um, and I'm gonna demonstrate that right now. Now I'm going to demonstrate um, a more energetic and clear articulation style and I'm going to be playing an excerpt from Scheherazade um, and this is just kind of like, excuse the dog barking in the background, um, this is just kind of a demonstration of, of what a harder, more um, energetic articulation sounds like and... very energetic kind of gets you moving and um, and really changes the whole feel of the piece next we're going to talk about mutes and how you can use them so I'm just gonna get right into showing you mutes and uh, when you write for mutes just know that I carry this big bag around that has like 10 mutes in it um, because when you play like a musical you literally use all of them it's crazy but the most common mute is a straight mute and it's a metal straight mute so here's a, I'm just gonna play the same thing over and over again. The straight mute. Has that little tin texture at the end. There is another straight mute that is, um, even though it would say straight mute, I might use this one instead. This is a lyric mute or lyric straight mute. And has a little softer sound to it. And the reason why I would use this over the metal mute is because you lose the character of the sound when you play quietly with this mute. Okay, and if you were to put the same, or play with the same power with the lyric mute, So it just sounds a little bit more genuine and the low lower and or lower register and just anything that calls for a sweeter sound. Um, this can definitely be heard over an orchestra. This cannot. Um, another very common mute is a cut mute. 
and it sounds like this. This is an open cut mute, open as in there's space here. Here is a sort of closed cut mute. Here is a completely closed cut mute, which everything is shut here. Or this would be called a tight mute. Um, if you wanted something like we were talking about range, how you can't play, you can't play high notes very quietly. You might use something like a cut mute, where you play really loud into the mute, but it comes out quietly. And so you're still playing with the power, and you're still getting the the energy of the note, except it's suppressed by that. So something to keep in mind. Uh, another really common mute is the is a harmon mute or a bubble mute, however you see it. Uh, if you play Dixie music, it would call for a stem in it sometimes. And what the stem is, you can actually put your hand over it. Uh, but this is actually not as common as you might imagine it to be in music. It was very big, I guess, in the 20s or like when Dixie music was was, was popping. But um, what's more common to use is a harmon mute, which is the stem out. And mutes definitely change colors when they get quieter and louder as well. So when you're writing a dynamic, know what the color and the character is going to be if you're going to write for this being loud. Um, some other mutes which are not as common, so I'm going to quickly run through these, are this is basically almost solely jazz. This is a bucket mute. <laughs> We have a a stone wall cut mute, which is just like the other cut mute, but it's a little bit brighter sound. And then I believe that's all. Oh yeah, we have the we have the oh, we have two more. So we have a plunger. <laughs> mute I have is called the stand and what I mean by that is we take our trumpet and we essentially you can't see my stand that's right by the video you would take your stand and you would put your trumpet right into the bell and it actually it sounds like this so it sounds it's basically this is that basically when you use a stand it's a quick fix if there's not enough time for you to switch to mute you would write in stand um, so we would play into our stands, and it would suppress the passage that we would we would play. Um, but yeah, so I think that's all I have for mutes. The next thing I want to talk about are alternatives to the B flat trumpet. Uh, this is the most common instrument in Western music, or at least in America right now, is a piston valve B flat trumpet. Uh, but other alternatives that you can write for are instruments such as the piccolo, and the piccolo. Um, it is, it can sound very cute, it can sound agile in the upper register, and it can also sound piercing in your ears. Fun fact, uh, there's a composer named David Mislenka who wrote for the piccolo, and typically you have one piccolo player, just like you would have one piccolo flute player, because too many is, is, is atrocious. Um, but he called for six piccolos, and he had him not only play six piccolos, but he had him play a screaming high note on the piccolo all at the same time because he knew that the intonation's terrible on this thing and that it's so piercing that it would come across that way. So when all six of the players played, the audience would see the trumpet players in pain playing these high notes and the audience would also feel pain in their ears because it's so horridly out of tune, but that's what he wanted. So if you want that, go, you know, do, do what you will with this thing. But anyways, um, Here's Piccolo. This is a, a broke piece by Tartini. So 
it's a little bit more agile in the upper register. Uh, with that being said, the piccolo should really only be used for agile passages. It is, again, it's very out of tune. It, the intonation is not great because it's a small instrument and we don't have slides. And although we can lip notes down, when we lip notes down into tune, being in tune, um, it loses its, its, its resonance and its character of the instrument. So let's say I'm playing a C in the center of the horn where it has the most resonance, um, but it's out of tune, so I need to bring it down. This is what it sounds like. You can hear it rings a lot more when it's in the center of the horn, but if that's sharp, then I have to bring it down, but you know, there's, there's take, there's take backs from that. So if you're gonna write in a slow piece with a piccolo, you want to um, have the instrument always moving so it can cover up its bad intonation. Another alternative is the flugelhorn. This has a rounder, soft sound, um, and it's typically found in jazz music, but it also can be found in classical music. Um, so here's the flugel. And so, although it sounds very sweet and sound round and warm, it's going to lose power in the upper register. So, like I was showing you earlier, when you play a D on a trumpet, playing with that same volume, it's gonna sound like this on a flugel. It's very difficult. And matter of fact, anything above the staff, like a, a G or higher above the staff is very hard to, to nail or to hit the center of the note on a flugel. So the, the range is a little bit more reserved for the, for the, the mid to lower. And then you can also play a mean pedal on a flugel. So. So you can also do that on a flugel. Fun fact. Um, yeah, so I think that's all we have for alternate instruments. There are definitely other trumpets that you can write for, like the C trumpets or the soprano, but um, these are the main ones that other people would actually own, are the B-flat, flugel, and piccolo. So yeah, thank you. All right, so moving on to good and bad key signatures. So obviously with every instrument, we have good and bad key signatures. Everybody hates the F-sharp, C-sharp, B type key, key signatures, all the sharps and all the flats. Nobody likes those. But uh, for the trumpet specifically, since we're a valved instrument, uh, our third finger is already notoriously a weaker finger. So we have finger twisters is what we like to call them with valve combinations. And some of those valve combinations are uh, one and three to two or two, three to one, um, one and three to one and two, just anything involving this third finger uh, it's just it's just typically a weaker finger so it, it's a little difficult and if you were to write in those keys and then a very quick passage moving upwards it just might make it harder than it needs to be um, but we recommend that you find an alternative if you want the performance to just go smoothly and it would just make it a lot easier for us too this next section is what we can do well as individuals uh, when you're writing the parts, know that not all trumpet players are created equal or can achieve the same thing. So with that being said, we encourage you all to write to the potential of our strengths so that you can get the best possible product in the end. So the things that I'm going to be showing you are skill sets or strengths specifically to me that maybe not the average trumpet player typically can do all the time, but it's something that I'm more gifted in or my strengths as a trumpet player. First thing um, I have in mind are our trills, our lip trills. And a lip trill is a trill over the harmonic series that doesn't use a valve to change the trill. Um, a trill, an octave down with a valve would sound like. And so yeah, those are trills. Another thing that I, I consider myself more is as an agile trumpet player. So I can play um, faster, more technical passages. Um, I also love playing um, 
the, the Piccolo. So I, going off of the agility, I, I love playing agile things, especially on the Piccolo. You get the idea. Um, I can't quite remember this this excerpt, <laughs> but yeah. So I love I love playing the piccolo. Um, I also can play uh, to the top of the staff on a piccolo. And yeah, so. Those are my strengths as a trumpet player. The, the rest of the things I'm gonna show you are just, just brief clips of, of things that I've done in the past. Here are some clips of me playing a few pieces that I have done in recitals in the past, just so you can get an idea of some of my skill sets. If you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Also, if you have any things you want to run by us in the writing process, if you want to ask us if we can do something, if it's even possible to do on our instruments, um, please, please run us by. Uh, run it by us. We'll be more than happy to, to talk and discuss that with you. But otherwise, I think that's it for this video. So thank you so much.